This is the fourth lecture for the 2014 uh, Trotwood Fire and Rescue Paramedic Refresher for February the 8th, 2014. All right, we're going to cover the CPAP or the Continuous Positive Airway Pressure lecture that uh, one of the nurses did for My Valley Hospital. It was actually for the Greater My Valley EMS Council. It was on their website, and we'll go through that. Some of you may have seen this lecture before. Uh, it's got some pretty good information just on CPAP itself and why we use it. So our objectives, we're going to define congestive heart failure, we're going to define um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, review the standing orders for CHF and COPD, we're going to describe CPAP, and then we're going to practice the usage of CPAP. Um, we actually will go over the usage of CPAP on the last day of class. So that is a congestive heart. Um, you can see that it's got a very large um, left ventricle, um, it's got dilated vessels, you know, very, very, very dilated um, and very congested. Congestive heart failure is a series um, disease associated with excessive morbidity and mortality and of elevated heart care, of health care costs. So because of CHF, you know, the excessive morbidity, so these are the people that, you know, they've got uh, pulmonary edema, they can't walk, you know, very short distance, they have chronic heart failure, um, you know, just, when I say chronic heart failure, I mean, like, they just, they can't even walk, you know, 10 feet without taking a break. They've got pulmonary edema, which in turn, you know, now they got coronary artery disease because of that. And it's just, it's downhill from there. And then they have a very high mortality rate. You know, there's not too many people that, uh, you know, go through their life with a congestive heart failure, congestive heart failure that don't get sick from it. In other words, it's not a... They have it once and they never have it again or they never have problems again. A lot of these people actually are ill for quite some time. It says even with advances in pharmacological therapy, the mortality for the disease remains very high. That's just because the heart is weak. Because the heart is weak, it just can't keep up. No matter if you're able to get rid of the flu and you're able to decrease the preload and the afterload and you're able to help them, then even with all that pharmacological therapy, that still doesn't mean it's going to help because their heart is basically as weak. So approximately 80% of the patients with congestive heart failure show a restrictive uh, spirometric pattern, extravascular volume expansion, and fluid accumulation in the interstitial compartments of the lungs. And the fuel, fluid accumulation is associated with increased heart size and reduced lung compliance. Um, so their lungs are not able to expand. They can't exchange oxygen as well um, at the cellular level. And also their heart they start getting cardiomegaly. Um, and they'll get the, once again, they get that dilated cardiomyopathy. You know, their vessels are very large. Their left ventricle is dilated. Um, their ejection fraction is really, really bad. And, you know, it starts getting down into the 40s and the 30s. And they're not able to, to empty that left ventricle. Then they definitely can go into heart failure. So the accumulation of fluids leads to the uh, flight in the alveoli, resulting in a deficiency in gas exchange with several consequences. So one, with muscle weakness. Two, dyspnea with routine activities. And then they also have dyspnea, uh, dyspnea that progresses into dyspnea at rest. So in other words, they'll get orthopnea. They can't lay down very much. Um, because they get orthopnea, they'll sit up and they actually sleep in a lazy boy. But then they get dependent, they'll get dependent edema because... You know, the way they're sitting, so they want their legs propped up, but they can't lay all the way back. So, all right, so it just shows the bronchioles and the alveoli, the oxygenated blood from the heart, the pulmonary arterial, oxygenated blood to the heart, pulmonary venule, there's the bronchus, there's the bronchioles, the alveoli, and small blood vessels or the capillaries. Right, so essentially that is the way that the blood, when it comes in, and then it exchanges at the cellular level. You know, exchange at the alveoli. Right, things we want to look for. We want to look for cyanosis or circumoral cyanosis, um, cyanosis of the male nail beds, any kind of clammy skin, that absence of fever, that's a big one. Um, once again, we talked about it, which still, thankfully, they finally... You know, did the right thing. We took Lasix or Formosamide out of our drug bags so no longer have it. So that absence of fear is not as big of a deal because we're not giving 
you know, Lasix anymore. A mistake by giving Lasix to the pneumonia patient. However, it is important to actually get the absence of fear or of fever because when we get to the hospital, we want to let them know because they may be able to give them Lasix at the hospital. Any kind of coughing, so wheezing or labor breathing. Pitting edema, they have rails and bilateral lower fields. Tachypnea, apprehension, jugular vein distension, and inability to talk. So these are all things we need to look for for pulmonary edema and making sure that we ruin these things out. Okay, so if CPAP is available, it says uh, its use is encouraged prior to the initiation of drug therapy. If their BP is above 100 systolic, we give them a nitro, 4 milligrams every 3, or I'm sorry, up to 3, 1 every 5 minutes, or 3 within a 15-minute period. So again, we no longer give the formosamide. We no longer give morphine pre-hospital. They will give these in the hospital. However, it is not in our protocol anymore. So now for our protocol, we're putting them on CPAP. We're giving them nitro. Those two things in combination will actually help a tremendous amount of your congestive heart failure patients before you ever get them to the hospital. So there's a picture of pulmonary edema. Um, you can see all of the white area here. So this is all fluid right here that's sitting down in their lower lungs. Um, so which decreases the capacity of your lungs. You can see they don't have a large capacity of oops. They don't have a large capacity in their lungs. So because of that, you can see that you know that's taking up you know almost uh, close to two thirds of their lung capacity. So COPD um, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's a progressive disease that makes it hard to breathe. It is progressive, which means the disease gets worse over time. So it's not like, you know, it's just bad and then it stays bad. It actually will start out mild and just progress it. Um, it'll get progressively worse. So it can cause a coughing that produces large amounts of mucus, which is a slimy substance. Uh, wheezing, shortness of breath, and that chest tightness, and then any kind of other symptoms that may be associated with it. So airways and the air sacs are elastic. And remember in COPD, less air flows in and out of the airways because of one or more of the following. So either the airways and the air sacs lose their elastic quality or they get like atelectasis. The walls between many of the air sacs are destroyed. The walls, the airways become thick and inflamed or swollen. Or the airways make more mucus than usual, which tends to clog the airways. Remember, COPD can cause coughing that produces large amounts of mucus, wheezing, shortness of breath, and chest tightness, and then other symptoms. All right, cigarette smoking is the leading cause of COPD. Most people that have uh, COPD, they smoke or they used to smoke. Um, the long-term exposure to other lung irritants, such as air pollution, chemical uh, fumes, or dust, <coughs> And those also may contribute to the COPD. So for us, we consider giving them 2.5 milligrams of albuterol, or we end up considering giving them Atrovent. We can repeat our albuterol. For COPD, we would try to give them CPAP, same thing as we did with the CHF. If they arrest, a likely cause is a tension pneumo, so we decompress them bilaterally. Remember, for asthmatics, we're giving them the um, 0.3 milligrams of sub-Q or auto-injector. We're giving them 0.3 milligrams IM with the auto-injector. And we're also giving them the 0.15 milligrams. So basically, we're giving them 0.45 milligrams. And then, with the med control approval, we can repeat our epinephrine if we have to. So, so what is CPAP? It's defined as consistent. It's continuous positive airway pressure. It's a tool that can be used for assisting ventilation and it should not be confused with trying to correct oxygen concerns. So what we're trying to do is push the air in, basically keep the alveoli open so we can actually get oxygen in there and it'll exchange. So indications for it would be a medical history of presenting complaints that are consistent with pulmonary edema. Remember that the patient has to be 16 years or older. They have to have a history of COPD or asthma. They have bibasilar or diffuse rails. Near drownings or disasters of mass casualties such as the bioterrorism with the cases of respiratory distress. 
things that we want to look for that we want to make sure that is a contraindication for using CPAP. If they're in respiratory or cardiac arrest, that doesn't help us any. They have to be breathing. Forcing air into their lungs without them breathing doesn't help any. They have to be able to expand their alveoli. Any kind of agonal respirations, that doesn't help them. They have to be breathing normally in that aspect. Several, uh, severely, severely depressed level of consciousness. So if they cannot follow commands, they're not holding their own saliva, then this is contraindicated. Systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters of mercury. If they have any kind of signs and symptoms of a pneumo. If they have the inability to maintain their airway patency. Once again, this is if they're not able to handle their own secretions in their mouth, then they're not maintaining an airway. Any major trauma, especially head injury with an increased ICP or significant chest trauma, because we can end up having barotrauma or we can increase the intracranial pressure in our head by using the continuous positive airway pressure. So CPAP, make sure that you do not use it on any kind of major trauma, especially in the head injury or the increased ICP patient. Any facial uh, anomalies, so like burns or fractures, you don't want to put it on their face, you want to make the fracture worse. You obviously don't want to put it on their burn because what skin they may have, you may end up peeling off. If they're vomiting, that doesn't help you any because then they're going to vomit into that uh, mask. The mask is blowing forceful air in and then you, know, you can blow it down in their lungs and then they can have a, end up with uh, aspirational pneumonia. So the patient deteriorates while on CPAP, in other words, their O2 sets are at 90% or below, then you have to get them prepared to intubate. Don't mess around with it. All right, so some of the hazards that are associated with CPAP, patients can become hypotensive, they can have pneumothorax, and then they can have corneal drying if you don't. Uh, this is a poor fitting mask. If you put a large mask on a little old lady, then they can get corneal drying and can't recover from that sometimes. All right, so benefits. It says the main direct uh, benefits of CPAP are improved oxygenation, decreased respiratory effort, and decrease in left ventricular preload and afterload. So um, I've had several patients, not since I've you know I've been promoted, but when before I was promoted, and also when I worked the, in the hospital and in hospital. Patients that you thought were, you know, knocking on heaven's door, they weren't going to make it, um, very, very ill, and we use CPAP on them with, you know, consistent nitroglycerin, doing that, uh, you'd be amazed at the turnaround these people made, so definitely early CPAP, early nitroglycerin, you can't go wrong with it. So recent studies showed that with two weeks of CPAP usage for patients with CHF, pulmonary function was improved. So what are our goals? Our goal is a CPAP. We want to eliminate the dyspnea. So we want them to breathe better. We want to reduce the respiratory rate. We want to reduce their heart rate. We want to increase their oxygen saturation. We want to stabilize their blood pressure. So those five things, that is our goal for CPAP. Those are the things we want to see. We don't want them short of breath. We want to make sure that they're not tachypnic. We want to make sure they're not tachycardic. They need to have oxygen so the brain actually works. And if their blood pressure is through the roof, then the brain's not going to be getting the oxygen it needs. If their blood pressure is too low, it's not going to get the oxygen it needs. So, you know, you have to make sure that you're stabilizing that blood pressure and you are increasing their pulse oximetry to compensate for that loss. Um, if they did, uh, essentially, if their pulse oximetry went down, you want to make sure that it gets back up. And if we can do that with CPAP. Right, so it says once a patient is started on CPAP, only remove it if the patient deteriorates or under medical control direction. If you've ever had a patient that was on CPAP and you, you know, there's severe respiratory distress, put the CPAP on them, they start getting better, you take it off, it is not instantaneous, but pretty close that the patient will actually go back into um, the extremis for the you know, exacerbation for the breathing. So let's call ahead to the ER and inform them that the patient is on CPAP and do not just unhook the patient and leave. So make sure that you call ahead so they have everything ready. They're going to get respiratory down there. Respiratory is going to come down with their little cart. They're going to have everything ready. As soon as we put the patient in the room, they're going to put them on, the, put them on their bed. They're going to take your mask off, put their mask on. Literally an instantaneous thing. 
because they don't want to break that seal. They also want to make sure that the patient has a continuous positive airway pressure. All right, so once again, it's a fairly fast lecture, um, and you'll be tested on this through the quiz process. But CPAP has been found to be as effective or more effective than the conventional pharmacological interventions. So you try that first. CPAP with nitro. So CPAP before you ever start giving albuterol or atrovent, early CPAP, early nitroglycerin for the CHF patient, early CPAP for the COPD patient. Okay, that's the end of that lecture. Thank you.